Um, my name's Kate Smallman. I'm a diabetes nurse specialist. Um, I work for a small organisation called the Diabetes Projects Trust, and we're based in Otara. Um, I also do some work for um, East Tamaki Healthcare. I would do a clinic there once a week, and I also work one day a week with counties, so really cover quite a range of things. Um, so Sue asked if I would come and talk about starting people on insulin in 20 minutes and I'm thinking well no we can't really do it in 20 minutes but we'll have some ideas. I then thought about you know I came earlier today and I was listening to some of our presentations which was awesome and we've had some lovely speakers today and I was thinking are we being too simple here and then I, I, I remembered last week one of the um, SMOs was discussing about the number of referrals and he had a thousand referrals from GPs to, to secondary care and that made me think, no, we, we actually do need to go back to the basics and let's have a look and see what we can do. Because so many of our patients can be looked after in primary care, um, but we need the support and help from others. So I'm just going to run through um, insulin um, and just some ideas and thinking about it. One of the things we think about is our, our, our poor old patient. We say to our patient, we need you to start on insulin. Um, and the patient says to us, well... I, I don't want to go on insulin because it's going to hurt. He says, my diabetes has got worse. So, you know, that, that concerns me. I'm worried about putting weight on. I failed. You know, a lot of our patients feel they failed their diabetes um, and they've been told off and their guilt about it. The family member went on insulin and they died. So I'm, I'm not going on to it. Um, or I went on to dialysis. Um, my life would be less flexible. Um, I don't want to have hypos and I'm not confident that I can manage it. So all this is going through our patients. They're thinking, no, I don't want to do this. And we're saying, yes, we think we should be. So the patient's already putting up barriers and saying, no, I'm not going to do it this time. But then <clears throat> we have our doctor or our healthcare professionals, can be just as much as a nurse. Um, you know, we're worried about our patients. They're not really actually doing what they should be doing. They're not taking their medication anyway, so should we put them on insulin? Uh, unfortunately, you know, I'm not really interested in diabetes. You know, diabetes is complex, and you know, I'm not really interested. I haven't actually got the time. You know, it's time to go home, and this patient needs to go on insulin. And it's going to take me too much time. I'm worried about what else is going on with this patient. I'm worried about what what's going on with my practice. Has my nurse got enough time to see this patient? Can they manage it? What's going to happen? We really haven't got the resources. We can't get hold of anyone. We don't know who to refer to. We don't quite know what's going on. Um, I'm worried about hypos. That patient's going to take their insulin, they're going to have a hypo, and then there's going to be problems. And I'm worried that patient's already overweight, and we're going to put them on insulin, and they're going to put on more weight. So as you can see, we've got both lots of us, you know, patients and healthcare professionals are all going, oh, I don't really want to do this. So you can understand why our patients then stay for months, if not years, without going on to insulin. So we need to actually look at this inertia and work with it. We know that a, diabetes is a journey. We know right at the beginning we've got to be starting with lifestyle. We've got to get the, the healthy eating and the exercise. And, and that's why we've got Teresa talking today a bit about um, healthy eating. Because we know that's the crux. We've got to get that right at the beginning. We then think about let's start them on small medication. And, and it's great. We've got Sarvin coming to talk about some of the new medications. So we've, we have got some new options, which is great. But then we've got them on all this medication, their diet, their exercise, it's still not working, we need to start them on insulin. But often we get them on insulin, but they don't come back, or they come back and we don't do anything about their blood sugars, and they stay on 10 units for the rest of you know, their lives or for the next two or three years. So you know, we need to be working with this and making sure that we optimise their treatment. So the guidelines, and the guidelines are old, you know, the 2012, 2013 guidelines, um, they haven't changed much, and I think we should still be using them. Um, but really, if the HP1C does not meet or closely uh, get to that approached um, target, and it's an agreed target, you know, you're going to have a different target for your 80-year-old to your 20-year-old. So it's an agreed target that you're thinking, what, well, we need to be doing something. If the patient's suffering with signs and symptoms, but we need to make sure that we've got the diet and exercise right first and that actually they're managing their medication. You know, just because we prescribe the stuff doesn't mean that patients take it. And it's one of our jobs to find out are they actually taking the medication or not. 
HBO and C's are great, but the problem is with an HBO and C, we know what an HBO and C is, but our patients don't. So using charts like this is really good because then the patient can actually see and can visualise what's actually going on um, with their blood sugar control. <coughs> so we need to assess <coughs> the patient. Are they ready to go on insulin? Let's start getting them to do some blood testing because really we need to get some results so that we know what's going on. A high HbO and C is not enough. We need to do some home blood mo monitoring as well and see if we can get the patient to take a little bit more control of what's going on in their diabetes. If, though, we're not managing this, if we think that they um, need more advice, you know, if they're vocational drivers, if they're very thin or they're losing lots of weight, or they're a child or an adolescent, we should be referring them on to secondary care. Now, even though I said that we're getting a lot of referrals, there are some people that need to be, be referred on. Um, so if people are getting hypos, um, if their HbO1c is very high and we're not getting anywhere, let's refer them on, let's get some help. So which insulin? I mean, that's, that's the big question. Which insulin do we start them on? Do we start them on once a day? Do we start them on twice a day? Do we start them on three times a day? Do you think they're going to be able to manage a basal insulin and then maybe a bolus? How, how are we going to manage them? Are they eating a large evening meal? Um, what's going on in their lifestyle? What's, what are they doing with eating? How are they managing with working? Are they working night shifts? Does that change? And how old they are? So all of these things we need to ask our patients and find out before we start thinking which insulin. I thought I could put up charts with lots of different insulins, and I found this slide, and I thought this, this actually just shows us that, 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 that we've got all these different insulins. We've got the three different drug um, insulin companies here today. So when we go to coffee, go and see them. Go and have a look at the pens. Go and ha have a play with them. Because the question I often get asked is, which insulin goes with which pen? You know, we're supposed to say to our patients, right, you choose which pen do you like. You know, if you put them all out, which one are you going to choose? Well, I'd probably choose the red one because I like red. Uh, does that make any sense? And it's kind of, no, it doesn't make any sense. So we need to know our patients and what's going to suit them. You know, is a disposable pen going to be easier for them? Or is it a pen that's, that's easier for them to carry around? Um, how do they load them? What are they doing with it? So think about the type of patient you've got and the type of insulin that you want to use. What do you do about the oral medication? You know, lots of things we've got to think, are we going to just stop them? No, we're not going to stop the, the oral medication because most of the time that's still working. You might think about cutting this off in your ears. You might think about cutting them back. But again, it depends on what kind of insulin you're putting them on. If it's a once a day only, you're not going to stop the sulfur in your ears. But remembering sulfur in you know, your ears have a time limit after probably about eight to ten years, the patient's pancreas is beginning to fail, the sulfur in your ears aren't going to be working any longer. So we need to have these questions, which insulins? I always start my patients on ten units. It's a, a nice little dose of insulin. If I've got a little old lady who's very thin, I might start them on six units, just because they're small. But again, check the blood sugars, see what's going on with them. If it's once a day, it will be in the evening. But again, it's up to the patient because with, with, um, with Lantus, it can be taken any time of the day. So you might decide with them depending on what type um, of job they have when they're going to start that. Um, you might decide to start them on a premixed insulin, in which case it would be before their meals. But we need to have that conversation because often we get them prescribed and it's taken once a day or taken it in the evening. We need to talk with our patients about what time they should be taking this insulin. And then we need to make sure we increase the insulin and we gradually increase it. And it's really about getting those blood sugars back down to a normal level without them having hypos. We need to make sure they're self-monitoring, so when to test, how to test, how to record, have they got a logbook, um, what to do if they have hypos, um, what to do if they're feeling unwell. Injection technique, it's all good stuff. We need to be looking at where they're injecting and ask the patients, you know, could you show me where you inject? Because often when the patient will show you their abdomen and you can see the bruises or you can see where they've injected, you can then have a conversation. If they show you their abdomen and you can't see any signs, are they actually taking their insulin? And this is questions and answers we can, we can ask the patients. But it's really looking and discussing with the patients how they're doing these things. 
So when we're cycling them on insulin, we need to think about how and when to monitor their blood sugars, how and when to give their insulin, where to give their injections, when to give their insulin, how to store their insulin, how to um, store it if, um, if they're using it. So, you know, the, 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 the spare insulin's kept in the fridge, the one they're using can be kept at room temperature, but also how the insulin works. Where do they get the insulin from? Where do they get the, the pens from? Where do they get their needles from? How do they dispose of their needles? How do they treat hypos? When do they need to, to change their dose? Do they need a medical alert um, bracelet? Who to contact if there's a problem? The size of needles. Now, as you can see, there's a lot here that we need to discuss with our patients. But often I know when I go in and prescribe needles, you know, they come up and usually people will prescribe whatever's on the top. You know, those 12 mil needles are big. You know, they equally, the lid doesn't go back on the pens if you use them. So they really, we should not be prescribing them at all for our patients. The research actually says that a 5 mil or a 4 mil is suitable for all our patients, no matter how big they are. So let's go for a smaller needle that makes it more comfortable for the patient. So we then need to look at if once a day injections don't work, change. Don't just wait, change them to a different insulin or add something else in. Think about a pre-mixed insulins. I like pre-mixed insulins because they're easy to use, they're easy for our patients, because sometimes our patients, they just don't quite know how to do it. You know, if we say to them, I want you to alter your insulin, they go, oh, I've altered my insulin because my blood sugar was high. And you say, well, it's high because of your insulin that you've had, not the insulin you're about to have. And they look at you and they find it really hard to, to comprehend. So let's work out how we can explain to our patients how the insulin works and what's the easy thing for them. So always look at your patient's meters. Always ask for them. Get them to bring it in with you because then they know that you're interested. You know, if people don't ask to see their, their meter or their book, they don't think that anyone's interested. They don't do the testing. We need to go back and look at the lifestyle, the diet, the exercise and compliance. Always go back and talk about, you know, how often do you actually miss your insulin or how often do you miss your tablets? And patients will tell you, you know, as long as they don't feel they've been told off. So look, thank you for that. It, it's, that's just a rush through it. As you can see, there's so much to know about our patients and it's about working out what works for our patients. Thank you.